uh, welcome to our Untwisting Twisted Scripture series. Um, I, you know, I do want to start this message out with, with this. Um, I, I think I make this clear most of the time, that you know, I'm not the final authority on these things. The more and more I study some of these scriptures, the more and more I see that there could be, there could be many different perspectives on these things. But um, what I'm hoping to inspire in you is that you dig into these scriptures on your own, and I believe that Lord is going to show you something new and something different. Um, not that changes the, 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 the meaning, the significance of, of the scripture, but you know, all, all scripture is there to encourage us, to speak to us, and I believe that, that no matter what story we're reading, there's something that we can glean from it and, and apply it to our lives. Um, but in that... I feel like I want to kind of set the, set the stage before I go into the, the topic of this message this morning. I want to read a few scriptures. I got a bunch of scriptures I'm going to read, and I'm just going to plow through them. They'll be up on the screen, but if you want to write them down and spend some time with them later, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I want to start with this. Hebrews, 12, or Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due in his change. Numbers 23.19, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has, has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? John 14.9, Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? 1 John 4, 7 through 21 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that he might live through him. Why did I read those passages of scripture to you. Because when you, when you read certain passages or certain, certain stories in the Old Testament, I think sometimes people have a perspective that, that God looks very different in the Old Testament than in the New. And I want you to know that according to these scriptures, God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. Well, when you, when you read through certain stories, it looks like he deals with mankind a little bit differently than he does in, in, the, in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. God is still the same. His, his character, who he is, his integrity is still the same. And I, I, love, I love the emphasis this morning during worship about this emphasis of love, the foundation of love, because, because it, it says in that last passage of Scripture that I read to you, God is love. Therefore, everything that he does, everything that he is, is motivated out of love. Now, we have trouble understanding this because we can be so unloving sometimes. But when it says God is love, it doesn't just, it just doesn't mean that he manifests love. He does loving things. It means any definition of love is wrapped up in who God is. God is love. Love would not exist if God did not exist. Therefore, everything that God does, everything that he does is motivated out of love. Why do I say that? Because it looks like at times things don't seem to be motivated <laughs> out of love. But if you, if you have loving parents, even correction, even discipline is motivated out of love. God is the good father. He's a loving father. Even when he disciplines his children, even when he exacts judgment, he is loving. I've heard people say, you know, they'll, they'll define God, you know, God is loving, God is kind, you know, God, God is good, but it's, there's no but. He's good, he's loving, he's kind, and he's holy, he's righteous, and he's just. It's not, it's not an either or. He is all those things. And to insert a but in that is incorrect because that's, that's where the confusion comes in our mind. God can be perfectly loving 
imperfectly just and holy and righteous at the same time. And that's our trouble as we read and navigate through Scripture, particularly Old Testament Scripture. Um, I had a hard time coming up with the title of this message, so I just called it War, Violence, and <laughs> Slavery. But I've realized that I've bit off more than I could chew. So I, I just, I, I just want to talk about some of, the, some of the passages of Scripture that people get stuck on where it seems like God seems to be angry. Because if you have a picture of an angry God in the Old Testament, it's an inaccurate picture. Does God get angry? Yeah, God gets angry at sin. Sin in his people. But he doesn't get angry with people specifically. It's about the things that they do. He gets angry because he's righteous, not because he loses his temper. When we think of anger, we think of somebody stomping around, letting their emotions take control of them. That is not God. God is calculated. He thinks. He's he's never, he's it's never emotions first, then actions. You know, because God is completely wise in all that he does. So when God is angry, he is justified in his anger. Many times when we're angry, we are not justified in our anger. We're just annoyed. Sometimes we get angry with our kids, not even really so much about what they did was sinful or not, it's just that they annoyed us, or they didn't listen to us again. That's not God. And sometimes I think that we project things on God, so therefore we have an inaccurate picture of who God is. I want to try to correct that picture, so that when when you read the New Testament, or the, the Old Testament, these scriptures take on a new light. That's what I'm hoping to do. I'm hoping that, that I, I can give you a new perspective. I'm going to share my perspective, but I'm hoping up that, that, I, that I stir something up in you, that if there's, there's things in the scripture that trouble you, that you go to the Lord, you go to that intimate place with the Lord, and, and that he would resolve those things for you. Because if you get stuck on things like that, it will affect intimacy that you have with the Lord. Amen? All right. So, I want to start with this quote in a book. It's, it's a best-selling book. I didn't, I've actually read excerpts from, from the book. It's called The God Delusion. And it's by atheist Richard Dawkins. Many of you have probably heard of his name. He refers to the God of the Old Testament as jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, unforgiving, a control freak, vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, misogynist, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a long list of things that he, that he attributes to God. Now, I read these things, and I'm slightly offended. I don't get hung up on it, but then I, but I, then I, I, I quickly get this perspective. There are are two perspectives that you can have as you, you go through these passages of Scripture. There's two types of people. There are believers who have intimacy with the Lord because we have Christ in us. So even though we might be troubled about some of these Scriptures, generally we default to, well, God at least knows best. He's loving and he's patient and he's kind. But when you have somebody like a Richard Dawkins who's a proclaimed atheist, or you have someone who's just a seeker who hasn't really found the Lord, there's another perspective that they can have because they will project their experience and their relationships on God and assume he is motivated by the same things that they're motivated by. But that's not the case with God, and we know that because we have a clear picture, a clear perspective of who God is. But even if we as believers have two different pictures of who God is in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I think Jesus clears these two pictures up in this passage in Luke 17, 28 through 29. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day of Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. See, Jesus, we call Jesus perfect theology. If you've seen Jesus, then you've seen God, the Father. People are more apt to like Jesus over God. But Jesus right there was saying that, that this, this judgment that was exacted on Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus approved of it. 
Now, I don't say that to you so that you would have a dimmer view of who Jesus was. I, I, want, I want to highlight just how terrible sin is. And you see a clearer picture of just how terrible and gruesome and violent and awful sin is in the Old Testament. More so, I believe, in the Old Testament. See, when you read the Old Testament, this is why you need the new. When you read the Old Testament, you, you only see things in part. You don't get a full perspective of who God is. That's, that's why you need the new covenant. If you just stopped with the Old Testament, first of all, you'd never find Jesus. But you would never see who, who, who God is, truly. You, you, need, you need both. But what Jesus is saying there in that passage of Scripture is that God can be loving, but he's, he can also exact justice. And there are times, and, and there will be a time even for us, even though we, we see a very different world than, 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 the, than the Old Testament world, one day sin will be judged. The sin in mankind will be judged. There will be a final blow, and it's not going to look pretty. But I want to show you something in these passages of Scripture that maybe you, that you, didn't, you didn't see before. Maybe you saw the judgment of God and you didn't understand it, but you just, because you know who God is, you just kind of let it go. You didn't dig into Scripture. But I'm going to show you something in Scripture, even with that judgment, I'm going to show you the goodness and the kindness of God. Now, there are loads of them which is why I felt like I needed to narrow the titer, title and just talk about some, some war scenes where God has told the people of Israel to go and exact judgment on, on a certain nation, a specific type of people. But I've noticed that, that these particular passages of Scripture tend to be the most extreme when it comes to God exacting justice through the nation of Israel. But I want to show you in these passages of Scripture that, that the loving God and the patient God and the kind God can actually be clearly seen. Let me go to uh, Genesis 28 or 22, 18 first. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is, this is God speaking to Abraham, saying that my, my desire is that all the nations be blessed by you, by your descendants. Right there at the beginning in Genesis, before you start reading all the horror stories and all the battles and all the, all the violence in the Old Testament, God is revealing his heart, that his heart is for all people, all nations, all, car, all cultures. He's, he's saying in that passage of scripture, I'm going to use one person that will create a nation that will bless all nations. God took great care for the nation of Israel because eventually out of them would come someone who would bring salvation, renewal, and restoration to the, uh, the entire world. See, God had a plan. It was plan B. Because plan A was that sin would not enter into the world and we blew it. So God had to initiate plan B. And, and God had to kind of stoop down and work with mankind because he gave mankind authority in the earth to, to bring forth righteousness, to, to exercise his authority, and many, many neglected that authority. But God took great care to preserve the nation of Israel so that eventually Jesus Christ would come from this lineage and he would bring salvation, renewal, and restoration to the entire world. God was merciful, and he warned of coming judgments if nations and people didn't turn from their ways. In Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in death, in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn, turn his way and live. God's heart was always that the wicked would turn from their wicked ways, stop doing wicked, wickedness, and would become his sons and his daughters, would become, would, would become extensions of the nation of Israel. That was always God's heart and always his desire. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Canaanites. Why did God command the mass killing of people like the Canaanites? God's judgment was on a culture that was utterly consumed by detestable religious practices. I want to give you a picture of who the Canaanites were. In Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 6, it says, Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess the land. But it is because of the wicked, wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out 
from before you. I want you to notice something. He's, it says, I'm driving them out. I'm going to show you in these passages of Scripture that, that God's, God's first attempt was to drive them out of the land. But they didn't leave the land because they were a wicked people. They were unrighteous. In, Dan, or in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 14, it says, there shall, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. He's talking to the Israel, Israelites, but he's referring to the Canaanites. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all, uh, all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because these abominations of the Lord, your God drives them out before you, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. He's comparing the nation of Israel to these Canaanite people who practiced... Um, all sorts of sexual immorality, child sacrifice, witchcraft, occult activity, um, just every kind of deviancy that you could imagine the Canaanites practice. Yet, yet God was still showing compassion to them because he wanted to, he wanted to drive them out of the land, but they would not leave because they were selfish and self-absorbed. Leviticus 18, 24 through 25 said, even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin. And the land vomited out the inhabitants, speaking of the Canaanites. See, God was judging the Canaanites. Those passages, the earlier passages that I read re were referring to the Canaanites. His desire was that, that all men, all women, all people group, all cultures would, return, would turn from their wicked ways and become followers of him. But they did not. The culture of the Canaanites was deeply sinful to a degree that God decided to to act in judgment against them. Deuteronomy 12.31 said, You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. Leviticus 18 gives details of many of the sinful religious practices that the Canaanites participated in. Again, child sacrifice to the god Moloch, incest, bestiality, homosexuality, and cultic prostitution. <laughs> I'm doing it. God's desire is to preserve Israel from the religions of the Canaanites. See, he knew because the Canaanites would not return or, or turn from their wicked ways, he had to remove them from the land. Why? What does history tell you? What happened to the Israelites? They eventually started practicing some of the same things. God knew. you got to remember, people back then didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about even God's people didn't. We have this, we have this catalyst, this initiator in us, this power within us as believers that they didn't have because the Holy Spirit is in us. And because, of, because he knew that, that men were weak, he knew that he had to purge wicked people from the land that wouldn't turn from their wicked ways because eventually they would contaminate the people of Israel, and it's exactly what happened. And eventually, the Israelites were enslaved. In Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 18, but of the cities of these peoples which the Lord your God gives, us, gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, and the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations what they have done for their gods. And you sin against the Lord your God. When God commands the Israelites to kill everyone in the cities of the Canaanites, the reason he gives, gives it is this. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. God wanted religious purity in his people. And he knew that if he didn't root this out of the land, that they would eventually contaminate and, 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 and cause his people to fall astray. This is why it's so vital to God that Israel start off their life in the land without the influence of false religions that would eventually lead, 
lead them away from him. And sadly, because of the failure of the Israelites to obey God's command, when God told them to do something and they didn't do it, it created havoc for the nation of Israel and eventually led them astray and led them into slavery. So you might ask the question, gee, these poor Canaanites, did they even have a chance? God was patient with the Canaanites. Genesis 15, 13 through 16, God tells Abraham that his descendants will be slaves in a foreign country for 400 years, but they will return to the land of Canaan after four generations. The reason given for this delay is because the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. See, the Lord knew hundreds of years before that that it hadn't reached its full measure. Why Why was God being so patient with these people? Why didn't he just decide to remove them from the earth? I believe, this is my perspective, and I'm going to support it with some other scripture. I believe it's because he wanted the Canaanites to turn from their wicked ways. The judgment in Sodom and Gomorrah, which was close to the the Canaanite territory, and the deliverance of Lot was evidence of God's judgments against against sin. But, But remember... They, they were pleading for, for Sodom and Gomorrah. If I can just find a few righteous, and there were just a few righteous, but that's about it. But all the, all, all the nation was corrupt. If, if, if there was more righteous, if there were 10, if there was a dozen righteous, God would have probably spared them. But they were, they were so wicked. They were, they were trying to have sex with, with God's people and with angels. I mean, they were, they were wicked individuals. God was looking for some righteous, but he couldn't find any. And it seems that over the period from Abraham to Joshua, the Canaanites had gradually rejected what they knew about God and moved deeper into sin. The Canaanites knew about God's people. They knew about the Israelites. They knew about their ways. They knew their belief in one God, yet they ignored it and continued worshiping their many gods. There was salvation for those who converted to the faith of God. Do you remember Rahab, the prostitute? You know who she was? She was Canaanite. She heard about Israel's deliverance from Egypt and the victories over the Amorite king that God was giving the land of Canaan to the Israelites. And because of her faith in God, demonstrated her statement in her rescue of the Israelite spies. She she was saved from destruction and she was included in the nation of Israel. She became part of the nation of Israel, a Canaanite woman. You know, God's not racist. But God is righteous. If, if people are willing to, to turn from their wicked ways, then he will make them part of his family. So what was God actually commanding the Israelites to do? The command to annihilate was limited only to the inhabitants of the Canaanites. You know this accusation about God you know, just, just randomly just destroying all sorts of people groups? It was primarily just the Canaanites, and a few other rites, but primarily the Canaanites. Listen to this passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy 20, 10 through 20. When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. I'll read that again. When you go near a city of the Canaanites to fight against it, proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace... And open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. That wasn't, there were laws about slaves, I'm just saying. Now, this, this looks like, well, the nation of Israel is going to enslave you and they're going to treat you terrible. The, the goal was eventually that they would turn from their ways and they would actually become part of the nation of Israel. So they offer peace and if they accept it, then you, you take them into your cities. Now, if the city will not make, make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city, all of its spoils shall, shall plunder for yourself, and you shall eat, eat the enemy's plunder which the Lord God gives you. Thus you shall do all for the cities which are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations. See, you know, God was saying, it, offer peace to them. 
If they accept peace, then don't war against them. Verse 16. But of the cities of these peoples which the Lord God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hittite, the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest you, they teach you according to all their abominations which, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. When you besiege a city for a long time while making war against it and take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against it. If you can eat of them, do not cut them down to use it in the siege. For the, three, for the tree of the field is man's food. Only the trees which you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it is subdued. This is all about people, groups, and cultures that made war with the nation of Israel. God extended the hand of peace. If the hand of peace was extended, then they would become part of the nation, and they would actually be protected by the nations of Israel. See, you have to know the atmosphere and culture back in those days. They, They were constantly warring and killing one another. What God was trying to do was bring peace and governance and God, God's ways into the land. God makes it very clear that annihilation is only to be used in the case of inhabitants of the promised land of Canaan because the Canaanites were so wicked. God gave the Israelites strict rules about proper conduct in war against other enemies who did not live in Canaan, including this, that the priests were to bless the army before battle, which is in verse 3 of the passage I just read, that they were to trust God for the victory. So the victory came from God. It wasn't because of their might. The soldiers were to be excused for personal reasons if they had new land, a new house, or a new, new fiancé. This is in verse 5 and 8. The enemy cities must be offered the chance to make peace before being besieged. That when a city was captured, only the men were executed. The women and the children were to be absorbed into Israel and in possessions to be kept. You know, there was, there was this, I think it was called blood libel back then. If, if a man was not killed, eventually him and his sons would, would rise up against the nation of Israel. They, they would exact vengeance. It was required of them. The restraint embodied in this code of conduct is remarkable for that period of history. And against this background, the command to wipe out the Canaanites stands as a special case. You'll notice as you read through the Old Testament where it seems like God was really angry and it seemed like he lost his temper, it was with the Canaanites. It's an exception to the rule. The judgment was intended to be expulsion from the land rather than absolute genocide. Deuteronomy 9.3 brings these two ideas together succinctly. You will drive them out and, and annihilate them quickly as the Lord was promised to you. The first option was to drive them out. If they drove them out of the land, they were not to pursue them. The command, he commanded the Israelites many times not to pursue them. If they were driven out of the land and they ran, then you were not to pursue them because I just wanted to bring you into the promised land. Remove the wickedness from the land and establish my promise with you. God's judgment was primarily that the Canaanites would lose the land because of their detestable religious practices and in order to preserve the purity of Israel's worship to him. And as we read through Joshua and Judges, this appears to be borne out as the extermination of the Canaanites is never fully implemented because they were never to pursue them. If they fled, they weren't to pursue them. And because the Canaanites weren't destroyed, eventually the Canaanites infected the people of Israel. And eventually the Israelites fell into those detestable things, worshipped other gods, and ended up being in slavery for 400 years. So lessons from the Old Testament. The mass killings in the Old Testament are exceptions. And they have four things in common. And these are things that we can apply to our lives today. God is a righteous God. And he's a judge. And there's divine judgment that's coming to all. All of these are judgments of God against extreme sin. 
He gives time to repent. They are all preceded by long periods of opportunity to repent. What you lose track of when you're reading through Scripture is that it's hundreds of years between some of these events. It doesn't take hundred years to read the Old Testament. But there are hundreds of years between these, these events. So all these wicked people knew about the nation of Israel. They knew about the one God that they served. And they knew that if they didn't submit to that one God, that, 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 that they would be removed from the land. It was a witness to God. During the time of opportunity, there was knowledge available to people that enabled them to know about God. God's desire was to make himself known through the nation of Israel. Salvation through faith. People who had faith in God and were innocent before him were always provided a means of salvation. Always, even if they were Canaanite. And Rahab was an example of that. Their families were saved with them just as the children of those who were judged died with them. Someone is saved in each case except, I think, the Amalekites. I don't think anybody was saved with the Amalekites. But in every one of those ites, someone was saved. Multiple people were saved when they turned to God. And I believe that these principles apply to what the New Testament says about the final judgment. God's judgment on sin is a reality. And that's the thing that gets magnified much more so in the Old Testament. You know... I, I believe that God is revealing through the wickedness of these people just how terrible sin is and how desperate we need something to remove it. And, that it. and the only way that could happen is through Jesus, by changing men from the inside out. Now in a period where the opportunity to repent and be saved is open to us all, which, is, which came from the nation of Israel. And God's salvation has been made and Christ accomplished it on the cross. See, everything in the Old Testament was pointing to what would happen in the New. Everything in the Old Testament was pointing to something better. See, God was trying to get his people, God was trying to get the world, all the nations of the earth, to a place where they would serve the one true God because in that they would have life and they would have it more abundantly. But in the Old Testament, it's, it's, it's the sin, it's the darkness of sin that is magnified. And I'm convinced that's why those specific stories are shared. Not so that you can doubt who God is and how loving he is and how good he is, but you can see the judgment from God and how important it was that if, if sin is not removed from our lives, that's what sin can do. It can absolutely corrupt you. That's what I learned as I was studying through this and in, in, in reading about these people. It was a picture of the sin in, in my life that, that the Lord removed. If, if I tolerated that, and that's the application for us today. You know, we can be one of those ites if we tolerate sin in our lives. We can become just like them. If Jesus doesn't get a hold of us and we don't surrender to him, we can become like that. Sin can so corrupt us, corrupt our thinking, that we, that we don't think God is a loving God anymore and we reject him, which is exactly what Dawkins did. He didn't see God in a proper light because he saw him through the filter of his heart. And that's what God wants us to avoid. Salvation is in Jesus. And we come to him, all those things are removed from our lives. So whenever you as you read through the Old Testament, remember all those stories, all the violence is a picture of your sin and just how terrible it is and how just God is. But God is a loving God and he leads us to the New Testament, the New Covenant, where Jesus will, will change us permanently, where the Holy Spirit can come into our lives and now we're not ruled by laws and ordinances on the outside but on laws and ordinances on the inside because of what the Holy Spirit has done in us. Amen? Amen. I want to offer something. As, as I was preparing this message, I thought about my life B.C., before Christ. And there were things in my life that God would have considered detestable. And that the only way 
that, that that could be removed. The only way that I wouldn't give in to that temptation was to finally give my life to Christ. And when I did, I had the power to overcome those things. And that's what, that's what God was trying to provide for these ites. He was trying to provide for the, for the nation of Israel. He was trying to provide a pathway that you, didn't have to, that you didn't have to live for yourself, that you could live for him, that you didn't have to give in to those temptations, that, that you can, you, they could be a holy people, that they could be righteous. And ultimately, the only way that that can be done in its fullness is through Jesus. So Lord, I just, I just pray that if there's anyone in this room, in this sanctuary, who may be at a place where they think they're beyond reach, that they're hopeless. Or maybe they just don't know you and they're still questioning you, whether whether you're good and whether you're loving. Lord, I just pray that you would move in their lives, that you would move in their heart, that you would move in their mind, and that you would begin to draw them close to you. And I want to give them an opportunity to come to the altar and receive you. Because there's an opportunity for them to become part of your family. And when, when they become part of your family, they're protected by you. You lavish blessing on them. You make their life abundant. You bring healing. You bring spiritual healing to them. You bring physical healing to them. So if, you're, if you may be one of those individuals who doesn't know the Lord, or maybe you feel far from the Lord, maybe you're, you were once a follower of Christ, maybe you, you, you once went to church, but you haven't been in a while, but you just, don't be, you just so happen to be here today, I'm going to ask you to come to the altar and the ministry workers are going to pray with you. But I want to tell you that, that you can live an abundant life in Christ, that he has... He has a new family for you. He has a new way of living for you. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you bring conviction to our heart and conviction in our lives because that, that, that conviction draws us close to you because we, we need a remedy for it. We need someone to take that away. We, we need someone to remove that sin, remove that blemish, and we know, Jesus, you can do that. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Lord. I'm going to wait a few more minutes. Praise you, Father. Maybe you're viewing us online. God could reach you. You don't have to be here in this room. Today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day to make things right with the Lord. Because he wants you to live under his blessing. And he wants to make you holy and righteous and blameless. blameless. And Jesus can do that if you receive him into your life. Well, Lord, I just pray for anyone who maybe didn't have the courage to come up front, but they're, but they're listening online or they're sitting in their chairs. Lord, you can meet them where they're at. I pray, Father, that you would show them who you truly are and how loving and compassionate you are. And that, Jesus, you would come into their life and yet that you would make things anew. And that washes them clean from anything that they've done wrong, any sin, any crime that they committed, any bad thought, anything that they've done wrong, wrong is forgiven and it's, it's at the foot of the cross. So Lord, we thank you that you've led us into the promised land. And that promised land is a relationship with you, Jesus. And we just pray that you, we, would, we would make you proud that we would make you known, just like you desired from the nation of Israel, that, that, that they would make you known, that they would, 
they would reveal your love and your kindness and your righteousness and your holiness. Lord, that's, that's what you wanted the nation of, of Israel to do, but they failed in that task. And eventually you had to send your son into the world. And, and because you, you did that, we can become part of your family again. So Lord, we thank you that you're doing that in the lives of those who, who are receiving this prayer. And we just thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.